Father coming alongside and agreeing with my brother Caleb and this we are grateful that we can delve into your word and feast on your truths that you have for us. Lord God, as we do so this morning, I pray, Father, that you would envelop and inhabit the words of this message, that they would be your words coming forth, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you would bind Satan, bind the agents of evil or anything that would hinder, hinder harm, or deter us from learning, knowing, and appropriating the truths that you have for us today. I pray, Lord, that you would be lifted up, that you would be glorified, and we would be encouraged, and we would be edified as, Lord, we seek to do your will, and, Father, to see your kingdom cause unfold here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Lord God, anoint this time. Come forth through your spirit. Be magnified. Be glorified. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what do you think of? I mean, we're on Thanksgiving theme. What are you all thinking about? Thinking about Thanksgiving past. I know we're preparing for Thanksgiving, but you think about Thanksgiving's past. What do you remember? I mean, is it is it the food? Is it maybe the uh, football game that was on TV, the, the Thanksgiving parades? Do, do you really remember that when, when you think about Thanksgiving past? I mean, sure, there's a few dishes out there that, that come to mind. Oh, they made a fried turkey that year. It was so good. It was so juicy. It was wonderful. You know, it's, it's a great thing. But uh, what we really remember most is the atmosphere of the people that are around us, don't we? I mean, we, we remember who was at the table or who wasn't at the table. We remember the conversations or we remember, um, you know, the, the good time, the celebration, or, you know, sometimes in a, in a more a somber sense, we, we, we remember the, the, some of the difficulties, some of the conflicts, some of the things that we were going through during that time. And especially during this time, this is an unusual Thanksgiving that we'll probably remember for the one element of, of feeling uh, or being on lockdown, <laughs> you know, and, or, or at least that the, uh, many uh, authorities are hoping that you'll be on lockdown. We don't necessarily need to, to do that, but we can uh, celebrate and give thanksgiving and interact with one another in the way that the Lord dictates and the way that the Lord calls us to do. So as we recall Thanksgiving's past, but we prepare for Thanksgiving in, in upcoming on this Thursday, we want to certainly make see that uh, we are celebrating it and that conflict will be minimized, but even if that, that is there or we're feeling some of the pressures of what's going on, that we will indeed be able to give thanks, as the Word of God says, in all things and for all things. I mean, finding a way and finding what God is doing in that situation. And we want to look and find the best way to do that and what we need for that is to to get a recipe book well you know i mean we've got one book here that was the darby cookbook and that's got a lot of recipes in it but you know what when i when i've gone through this darby cookbook and i don't know if there's any more available so if you want them yeah i'm not trying to do a sales pitch i think we need to do version and edition number two so for all you out there who've got those delicious recipes you know maybe we would do a version number two but but you know, what I found in this cookbook as far as is Thanksgiving's past is it's really about the people. It's about the people who contributed their recipes to this. And when you look in it, the beginning of the book actually has a history of our church. And oftentimes on homecoming, we use this, this book uh, to, to recite our history and recall what God has been doing throughout the years and what he's been doing in our own community. And then when you go on the first next page, you got a, a, a kitchen prayer. It talks, you know, it, it's asking the Lord to, to bless every meal, but to bless it uh, for, for the work and for the partnership and really in the kingdom cause and to do God's work and to nourish bodies, to, to nourish and build relationships. And so as you go through here, you see the people who contributed. Some of them have, 
have long passed and, and are actually spending this Thanksgiving face to face with the Lord. And so we recall them and we recall those good memories, but we, we also look unto the heritage and the recipes for Thanksgivings to come so that we can enjoy them in the presence of the Lord with the people of the Lord. And so what we find today and what we're talking about is really uh, a recipe that we can have today and where we find the ingredients for making relationships we can be thankful for this Thanksgiving. And so to do that, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And a little backstory, if you want to turn there in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, I'll prim primarily be in uh, verses, you know, 3 through 6, and then I'll come back and circle around through 7 to 9 because it's really uh, supporting what Paul is saying and the, and the points that we are, are looking at here that are the ingredients or recipes for making relationships that we can be thankful for for this Thanksgiving. Because the backdrop of Philippians, if you remember, is he was in jail. I mean, you want to talk about a Thanksgiving on lockdown. That's Paul, okay? He's in jail when he's writing this. Yet he is giving and writing this book. He, matter of fact, he wrote the four books from, from jail, you know, the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And all of those have varying themes to it, but specifically Philippians has that theme of thanksgiving. But it also the theme that runs through it is joy, and another theme is unity, unity amongst God's people. And so you'll see that throughout all the book of Philippians, and even as we look at these points, you'll see these points enumerated and illustrated and even commanded or encouraged and admonished through the remainder of the book. I mean, if, if you take this even as an outline, to the book of Philippians and realizing the backdrop and the theme of joy and thanksgiving and unity, you'll see the illustrations. You'll see how he gives the theological backdrop for all this throughout Philippians, and it becomes exciting. And I would even recommend that you would go through Philippians on your own with these points in mind as you prepare your hearts for Thanksgiving, as you prepare to engage the people, some of them that you're looking forward to and some of them that, you know, to be real, you're kind of cringing. Oh, oh Lord, you know, Aunt so and so's coming, Uncle so. Oh, brother, oh boy, you know, they're gonna bring up that that issue again, or they're gonna come and lay out all their you know laundry before us. And so, you know, this will give us a preparation of the heart, and we can be thankful. And I'll I'll tell you what, we we can even be thankful for whoever's at the table because it will be a God ordained encounter that we are going to have. So. We look here and we see in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse um, 1 through 11, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers, the deacon, the grace, uh, he says, grace to you and peace from our God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to even get a backdrop of, of, of this and how it unfolds, you will see that um, uh, basically, this comes from the encounter that we see through uh, Acts chapter 16. When we first go into Acts chapter 16, you'll see the first encounter is with Timothy. He's a disciple of the Lord. Paul comes to him. He picks him up, and, and he, he takes him as his, his uh, you know, personal disciple, following after him for ministry. Then uh, Paul gets a call um, you know, in the spirit and a dream f to go to Macedonia. He goes to Macedonia, which Philippi is the capital of. And as he gets there, he runs into Lydia, who, who becomes a follower and a key member in the church at Philippi. And after he does that and he picks up them, well, Paul, you know, as he goes and preaches, every time he preaches, there's a revival or a riot or both in, the, in this case. And so Paul lands himself, you know, with Silas in jail. And so they're in jail, and they have this uh, encounter, but they're praising the Lord all night, and what God does through that is, guess what? He, he calls down basically an earthquake, sets the jailer, uh, or sets Paul and Cyrus uh, free at, at the captor of the jailer, and guess what? The jailer, he's, he's all scared because the prisoners are you know, being broken out of their jail cells, and he asks, what must I do to be saved? 
and he didn't mean only his skin for the moment, but he meant in a present sense and an eternal sense. And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your family will be saved. And so he took that message back, uh, took that message to the jailer and his family and all probably even that evening or in the following day received the Lord Jesus Christ in a great revival and were baptized and went forth to become key members in who you're seeing being written to right here. So that's why you see, you see Paul and Timothy and his writing to the overseers and deacons who probably the people who that we see in Acts 16 are, are the various folks that are, are receiving this letter. And he says, going forward. Now here's where the Thanksgiving ingredients, and we're going to really park here. But he says, I thank God. And then he's writing this from prison, okay? I'm, I'm thankful. You know, lockdown. I thank God in all my remembrance, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. Now I want you to take heart to what is being said there. And basically, and he is saying first and foremost that um, the ingredients that he is being th thankful for and that he is counting on and why he can be thankful for all these people is because one, the first ingredient that is being uh, put in the mix here is prayer. Prayer. He is, he is look, first and foremost praying for these people. And he even gives us a template for prayer throughout all this. And uh, basically he's, he's saying this. He goes, you know, if you want to have anything in your life that is good and to be grateful for and that will align you with the will of God, be praying. That's something to think about as we go into this thing. Are you praying for the people who are going to be at the Thanksgiving table? Do you pray for those folks that are around you? Are you praying for your family? Are you thinking of them not only just in what you're going to say when they come by or you're giving them a little pat on the back here and there, but are you actually in daily prayer on their behalf? Do you pray for them? Do you pray with them? We know that the people who pray together stay together, especially in a marriage where, where people want to align. The three-strand cord is not easily broken, and so when God is the the cord that's being invited into the marriage through prayer and through communication, which, of course, is the most important ingredient for any relationship to be there is to communicate, to be understood. You go to any psychologist, you go to any counselor, you go to any therapist or anything. The first thing that they're going to do is say, what's your communication like? How do you talk to each other? How do you interact with each other? And then they try to give you tools to do that. Well, Paul is saying here, here's tools. The first tool to do that is prayer, prayer with each other, prayer for each other. But, you know, oftentimes we go, yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, we know that. I mean, we've been in church all our life. We know prayer. But, you know, what you pray is important. How you pray is important. Of course, we know who we pray to in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But are you praying in a way that's effectual? The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But a righteous man is a mature man or a person or woman that is in communion with God and they understand the promises of God and that they can appropriate the promises of God in their prayer to God and they call it down. And so when Jesus says to pray, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Do you ever notice that about the, the Lord's Prayer? Because things start in the heavenlies before they come down and are manifested in the earthly realm. If it's not approved or commanded or ordained in the heavenlies, it ain't going to happen here. It's got to go through the heavenly realm. Even Satan has to ask permission to be able to, to inflict pain on people. And we see in Job 
him going and, and asking permission to do what he thinks, and God allows it. Of course, God has a greater purpose, working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. But, folks, it takes place in the heavenly realm. It's the heavenly design. Do you remember even in the book of Daniel and, and the, the fight and the war that was going on? But before the angel came and delivered the news of what was going to happen to Daniel, it said that there was a war and he was being battling in the heavenlies that things would, would take place. And then as the battle was won in the heavenlies, so it came down and manifest in the earthlies. And that is exactly what is needed to take place in our lives, in our families. You want change, you want communion, you want things to go better, well then we need to be praying. We need to be praying and we need to be understanding that. We can't be satisfied with just a few little words before a meal where we say, God is great, God is good, let him thank us for our food, bless the carrot, bless the peas, pass me some fried turkey, please, okay? That's very benign. And that doesn't shake the mountains. It doesn't move the mountains. It doesn't shake heaven and cause the earthquake like was experienced in the prison at Philippi where Paul and Cyrus were, praying, uh, were praising the Lord. They were singing to the Lord, but they were also, you can be counting on it, they were praying. And they were praying for the people at Philippi. Notice, notice the content of Paul's prayer, though. Here's what we, 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 we should be praying, and then we're going to see how we pray in Philippians. But look in verse 9 there, and it is my prayer. And this is just a brief outline of the things that you want to be appropriating. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. If you look in Ephesians, he starts off with a prayer and he's asking for many similar things. In Ephesians chapter 1, he is beseeching God for their wisdom. He is beseeching God that they would be partakers in the kingdom cause, that they would have understanding of spiritual things, but not only understanding, but they would have action that takes place in alignment with the understanding that they have from God. That, that when, they, when we pray and we get on page with God and we align ourselves with God, and then we go out and act according to our prayer and what things are settled in the heavenlies, that God settles in our own heart, then we go forth and we see action. Andrew Murray, a Dutch Reformed church missionary sent from Scotland to South Africa, he championed a revival in South Africa in 1860. He said, the Christian who is still carnal has neither desire nor strength to follow after God. He rests satisfied with the prayer of habit or custom. Just that little dinner table prayer, little, little nicety, Christianized, tossed up to the Lord, you know, bless our, our actions. Well, rather, what we should take for an example is Paul's prayer when he led for revival, but also looking at the, the prayer of one of the, a guy back who was a primitive Methodist, primitive Methodist, and he led a revival back in England in a, a fishing town. And it says that, that the chief Methodist was this guy named Praying Johnny. Praying Johnny was not known for his, his culture or his great intellect. He possessed neither. But what he possessed was faith that moves mountain. He was of average height, sharp features, light brown hair, brown eyes. His speech and his words were not considered eloquent to the ears of men, yet they were always sweet to the father's ears. Six hours each day, he usually spent on his knees pleading with God in behalf of himself, the church, and sinners. The primitive Methodists, and primitive Methodists is, is not like they're backwards. It just means that they go back to the basics. They're originalists with regards to their methodology. But the primitive Methodists love to preach, pray, sing, and shout. Well, John Oxtoby was certainly no exception when traveling in anguish, when travailing in anguish for a revival in the neighborhood in which he was laboring and deeply anxious to see the glory of the Lord reveal, 
he spent many hours secluded in retirement. It says that when he went, he was interceding for a town called Philly, an English fishery custom. And he went to the mission and he was praying and someone heard him praying. He was on his knees. He was wrestling outside the town in toil and a, and a baker or, or a miller came by and heard his prayers and heard him actually out loud wrestling with God for the town. He said things like, you know, God, I, I, I'm, I can't go in this town. I'm going to be a fool if I go in here because I said I'm going in the town for, to proclaim the Lord of the Jesus Christ and there is a revival that needs to ensue and people need to trust the Lord and if I go in there I'm going to be a fool I'm going to be a, a cast out and I'll never be able to show my face again in this place he wrestled he wrestled out loud he was on his knees and then he came to a point where he just stopped and had a peace and the miller heard him say, it's done. It's finished. It's a done deal. He went into that town, and you know what happened? Just like in Philippi, a great revival broke out amongst those ruly, unruly fishermen and townspeople. And he was remembered for the great revival that happened in Philly for many years to come because he first had it settled in prayer and he had it settled that he was going to go in there. Isn't that what Paul really said? I mean, back in Philippians, what you pray? You're praying for people. You're praying for love. You're praying for unity. You're praying for understanding. You're praying for revival. You're praying that people get on page with the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives for salvation and for sanctification. But it says that we shouldn't worry about that because ultimately it's not us, but be anxious for nothing. Right? But through prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then, as you have wrestled with God and you are asking for supplication on behalf of your family, on behalf of your friends, on behalf of your community, on behalf of your country, and you want to make a difference, then you too, instead of writhing in anxiety, can finally say, it's settled. It's a done deal. I've heard from God. I have aligned myself with God, and it's going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. You go to sleep and put your head down on that pillow, and you can rest at night going, knowing that it's in God's hand. So not only do we want, if we're going to have a recipe for relationships that we can be thankful for ingredients but the second ingredient that we need to realize is that we should pray but then also folks we partake prayer should lead to action actually the the saying and the slogan that used to go around was it was pray give and go the next thing that paul talks about as ingredients is is he says that that we are, he is joyful because of verse 5 of your partnership, your partnership in the gospel. That's a rich word, and you've heard it many times. But do we understand the word koinonia that's being used there? That means partnership. It really means sharing. But it's not just sharing with, you know, just chatting. Um, you know, it, it's wonderful, like we kind of stay after and we talk to each other and we, we do those things. But sharing and partnership is used here. It means partnership in the gospel. It means partnership in action. And it means partnership, as you'll see, and in, in, if you ever read Philippians, it's partnership in, yes, in celebration and enjoying good times of Thanksgiving, like at the table. It's partnership, though, even in a greater sense, like we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and there is koinonia in that. What is the Lord's Supper really about? It's about the kingdom cause, but it's about suffering. It's about working. It's about diligence and supplying each other's needs and bringing to the table and looking at everything through the cross, but living our lives in light of eternity, in light of service unto the Lord that comes through a relationship that we have 
in salvation in Jesus Christ, but the sanctification and the life that we live as a church body going forth together in partnership, working together. That's why Paul says later in the chapter, he, he talks it as a privilege that he would he can share in the suffering of Christ. He uses the same word, koinonia. He says share in the suffering of Christ and that you share with me in that same suffering. He talks about us being partakers of grace. That's the same word, just worked out a different way from its root, koinonia again. And then later he says, and thanks to Philippians, that he says when I was going through in, in Macedonia and everything, you shared and you supplied me in my efforts. And my God who is able is able to supply you all your needs. And that word keeps on coming up, the root of sharing. You share in the celebration. You share in the suffering and the toil. But you share in the supplying of the needs for those people while Paul was in jail, while we're doing uh, various things, while we're doing a Christmas marketplace, while we're reaching out to the community, while you're having dinner somewhere. Or you know what? When we're going through hard times, we get in our Bible study groups and we share each other's burdens and we lift them up to prayer and we commune with each other because the communing and sharing with each other is a great sense of comfort and satisfaction and consolation. I mean, don't we read? You know, if there's to be any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation, again, koinonia, in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy of being of the same mind, having the same love, being full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but the interests of others. Are you partnering and looking out for the interests of others? Are we truly engaging each other? That's why church fellowship, we call it, becomes so important. Seeing each other face to face because there is a dynamic when we all connect to each other that you can't get outside of the church, that you can't get outside of personal fellowship and isolation. When two or more are gathered, he promises to be in the midst. Is God everywhere all the time? Yes. Is he in your prayer closet? Yes. But when you face to face with another believer, there is something unique and powerful that occurs. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it best in his book, from life together. He says, God has willed that we should seek and find his living word in the witness of a brother, in the mouth of a man. Therefore, the Christian needs other Christ another Christian who speaks God's word to him or her. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. For by himself, he cannot help himself without belying their truth. He needs his brother, man, as a bearer and a proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. He needs his brother solely because of Jesus Christ. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. Do you ever... Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, have you ever experienced where, where, you know, your spirit bears witness to another spirit and you may be doubtful. I know I get doubtful and dubious. And I ask my wife, you know, I, I have a pra practically a, a mental spiritual breakdown before any time that I'm, I'm going to do ministry or something like that and doubt everything until I hear just a word from somebody else. Just tell me God's word. I mean, I, I just need to hear it from a voice that's not in doubt and you hear that word come through and God uses that spirit inside you to bring strength from your inner man to the other person's inner man and the spirit bears witness and testimony because we are the body of Christ we can't do anything without each other we are all interworking to bring encouragement 
one to another with Jesus Christ as the head. Isn't that a wonderful blessing that we have? But we have the opportunity to have partnership in Christ. So the first ingredient is prayer, praying for one another, praying for love, praying for unity, praying for the harmony, praying for the understanding. But then the next one is partnership. It takes action. It gets alongside a brother. What do you need? How can I help? How can I participate in what you're doing and what the church is doing? How can I bear your burden and care for you in a tangible way? Which leads us to the final ingredient. Oh, and this is, this is one that we, we really need to um, take hold of right here. And that is not only partnership, but it's personal growth. When we get at the Thanksgiving table, it's about personal growth. Oftentimes at the Thanksgiving table, I'm probably one of them. You get those EGRs who attend. You know what that is, right? We talked about it in the men's group. It's the extra grace required people. You know, they're they're just they're just nitpicky. They got they got an axe to grind. Relationships are a little bit friction and you get around those folks and it's just it's hard to be around them you know they just they're whatever it is their demeanor but you know what they're at your table they're in your family God didn't make a mistake who he put in your family God didn't make a mistake where he planted you in your church or your community or wherever you are and sometimes those people, even though it causes friction, just like sandpaper, I mean, you know, you rub sandpaper against something long enough, it's going to smooth it out. Well, God's maybe trying to work on our hearts to smooth out our growth and our sanctification. In order to do that, we need to be humble, just like it says to have one mind among us, but have the mind of Christ that Paul talks about who made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Are we going put to put to death our pride, put to death our attitude, put to death our, our wanting to be right all the time, even though we, we say we're speaking the truth, but it's really our just our, our own opinion my truth it's kind of like that husband and wife you know they they got together and the husband was was disparaged because he said to his wife you know you never you never say i'm right you never say i'm right you just you you never will say or admit that i'm right and the wife said sure i will if you'll say you're wrong i'll admit you're right (laughs) you know i mean we don't need to be like that so stuck on our righteousness, but we have to ask ourselves the question, would you rather be right or rather be reconciled? Because Jesus wants us to be reconciled, and that reconciliation comes through the cross. But maybe there's a little pruning that needs to take place, and that is within our personal growth. You see, um, oftentimes we need to be trimmed down a little bit and be shaped you know, but, but Paul says this, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal it also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. The form and your spiritual formation will take the shape of your spiritual focus. Your spiritual formation will take the shape of your spiritual focus. Who's your focus? Well, Paul says, follow me, but as I follow Christ. You know, there's a lot of examples throughout the Bible and a lot of examples through mature Christians who have been through what you're going through, who are in the process of being sanctified, who are in the process of maturing in their Christian walk. And we we take that from each other. Older women are instructed to teach the younger one. Older men are are there to 
to give guidance to the younger men and us be leaders as we've been walking with the Lord. We're not perfect. We haven't attained it. Paul says, I haven't attained anything, but I pursue the prize, which is Christ Jesus, knowing that I've not yet attained it. Yet we can each struggle and go forth together and learn from one another, but ultimately looking at Christ Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Your spiritual formation will take the shape of your spiritual focus. You remember the Karate Kid? Remember when he went in with Mr. Miyagi back in the 80s, that movie? You should watch it again. It's not that bad, but some, sometimes the language you got to watch. But do you remember that? That whole thing? And he goes in there, and he's trimming that little bonsai bush. And what does he do with the bonsai bush? He goes, I don't know how to do this thing. How do I get this right? He says, close your eyes and picture the tree. You go, okay, you got it? Yeah, we got it. He says, okay, now go ahead and cut it according to the picture and image you see. Well, the picture that we see and should be looking at is Jesus Christ in our focus, Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ resurrected, and the walk in which we walk worthy of the kingdom of God. But you know, there's a little twist to that story about your focus you know, the one who actually does the pruning is God himself. He is the one who prunes it. See, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and my word in you, and you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Those branches that do not bear fruit are cut and trimmed and pruned up so that they may later bear greater fruit. So he does a cutting away in our life, and sometimes it's painful. Sometimes we don't like it. It says in the book of Hebrews that while we're going through the discipline, it is not pleasant, but it yields the fruit of righteousness. And so we're in a pruning process, and like I said, sometimes the people, and oftentimes the people that God puts around you are part of that pruning process that we can look at in humility. But you know what? We've got, a, a, we've got the recipe for this to unfold in a wonderful way in which we have a recipe for the ingredients to have a wonderful relationships that we can be thankful for. It starts with prayer. It continues on with partnership. And finally, it ends with personal 